it's great to be among such a, an amazing crowd of people with, uh, with a ton of healthcare experience. Uh, I am myself relatively new to the field, so I'm very humbled uh, to be here. Um, I'm gonna uh, share my story with you and why I'm doing what I do now. Um, basically, born in the Netherlands, I see a bunch of orange uh, people here, so I fellow Dutch people. <laughs> uh, born in the Netherlands, uh, I uh, always had a passion uh, to go after problems, like I always loved them and uh, tried to kind of come up with, uh, with new solutions. Uh, to illustrate that, like uh, just a little story, uh, when I was about 10 years old, I was uh, clipping my nails uh, in the kitchen and my mom told me to go outside on the balcony because she didn't like the nails to uh, fly around. And I did not do that, but I came up with another nail clipper um, that uh, would prevent the nails from uh, jumping around <laughs> and ended up like patenting it. Um, a few years later, I, uh, I got into, uh, into websites and uh, uh, internet and building software, and I could apply this passion for solving problems very easily because I didn't need anybody. I could just go, uh, go on my own uh, and started a, a, an internet company in, uh, when I was in high school. I thought I wanted to be an architect, so I studied architecture. Um, I'm still not sure if that was a mistake or not, but I found myself uh, back in tech um, uh, right after I started a few companies, and one of them was a new way for people to interact on the mobile phones, and uh, we made an app called TapTalk, which you can see here, and that was the company that made uh, me move to San Francisco. And uh, the first, I still remember the first time I was in San Francisco, I was like super inspired and uh, jazzed up and I wanted to go there and this company allowed me to go there. Uh, so that same year that I moved, uh, I had some issues with my hearing on the left side and it, it sort of dropped and they diagnosed me, the doctors diagnosed me with different uh, diseases and I was living like between the Netherlands, Berlin and the US, so I had, I had doctors from everywhere. Um, and at some point, uh, you know, it, it kept on slipping and they said, let's make an MRI scan uh, just to kind of uh, see if anything else is going on. And I remember like walking in the doctor office and looking at the monitor and there was a tumor. Um, so that was like kind of a shock, like, oh my God, like uh, I, I didn't think that could happen to me. Uh, but it was about to get worse because half a year later, uh, a follow-up scan was made and um, another tumor was discovered on the other hearing nerve as well and one in my spine. So that, that was like one of the most scary things like I ever heard um, in my life. So I was diagnosed with this uh, genetic disease uh, called NF2. It's basically a mutation in a gene uh, called the NF2. A gene that creates a problem in the tumor suppressor pathway and uh, creates tumors in the in the central nervous system. And those tumors are, let's see, yeah, they are like um, benign, but they can cause all kinds of problems. So, for example, uh, patients lose their uh, their hearing, uh, their eyesight, and their mobility. Um, yeah, if, if you are unlucky, because the tumors are on the functional nerves and they basically uh, uh, break them at some point. Um, the worst was that uh, there is currently no treatment available for this disease. So I, I started doing, uh, doing a lot of research to kind of see if I could do anything. And the thing that I wanted is, like as a patient, I want an organization uh, with a genuine drive to pave the way for drug development in rare disease, because in rare diseases it is a little, uh, a little bit harder than in a lot of common diseases. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I did after I got diagnosed, uh, the challenges of rare diseases, and uh, the need for, for what we are working on. Uh, so right after my diagnosis, I still had this, uh, this tumor uh, on, the, on my left side that was growing, and uh, the doctors were kind of debating, should we 
operate on it or not, like should you take the risk of the surgery or like wait a little longer. And um, I also happen to have friends that had a, a great uh, startup in San Francisco uh, working on genetics and genetic tools to analyze the genome. So I kind of wanted the tissue, um, which I ended up getting. Uh, I had a, a tumor surgery. Into, can we go to the next slide? Somehow it's, it's pretty slower than I talk. <laughs> Um, but I had a surgery in 2015, and um, they removed the tumor tissue, and we ended up uh, sequencing it. Yeah, so this is me right after the surgery. Um, and here you see uh, a, a part of the data that, was, uh, that, that came out of it. So we did whole genome sequencing, 90x, uh, 90x uh, deep uh, on the tumor. And we ended up finding... Uh, another mutation that could indicate that I could benefit uh, from a, a drug that was on the market for breast cancer. Uh, so we already had that information, which uh, you know, was pretty exciting to me, like playing around with this. Um, but I, I didn't want to stop there. Um, we, uh, we thought, like, why not open this data up to a lot more uh, people? And we organized uh, a hackathon. We, we ended up, like, 2017, like last year, the hackathon happens. Um, we organized it with a, with a research community called SVAI uh, and Google. And we ended up with 300 participants. Um, and more crucially, also the science community, the people that were working on NF2 um, uh, were also there. The foundation was there uh, that, that supports the community. So it was a very uh, multidisciplinary group of people. Um, and over 20 uh, presentations came out, and I, I kind of uh, I'm going to show you a little clip uh, about that later to, to show you how that was like. Um, a few months ago, I started um, I started taking the drug that came out of all that research uh, to see if uh, to see if that uh, if that could help me to uh, slow the tumor growth down. Um, so just uh, just a short clip uh, to show how it was how that was like. For me personally, it was one of the most uh, crazy experiences I had in my in my entire life. Um, what does this mean, TNFs? All right, people, that's it. Make your commits. Pack up your stuff. Go to the auditorium. Did not could potentially represent biological features such as microRNA or transcription factors. I love the work that's going on with um, natural learning and language, be able to parse through thousands of articles and be able to pull targets. So doing something similar and then plugging into DeepTim would be great. So we were able to identify 236 ultra rare genes in Anos genome. It was very interesting to us because uh, Anos tumor is a total outlier over here. With this group, we were able to basically collect 82 different data sets and put it through a pipeline in 12 hours, which is shocking to me. A lot of the presentations were like way better than I thought they would be, which was kind of incredible to me. I mean, I think, I think in the last, really a lot of this stuff just came together in the last couple of hours. The whole thing is, let's see if we, see if we can find something that is already there and kind of repurpose for the disease. This is a very effective shortcuts and there are many tools we can use. Um, yeah, hopefully that gave you a little little glimpse. Uh, so, so something about the challenges um, that people with a rare disease are facing in rare disease in general. Um, so the first thing people think about rare disease is that it's rare but it's actually very common. Uh, so an estimated one in 20 people in the world uh, have a rare disease. And in the U.S. and Europe, like curiously enough, it's, it's estimated one in 10. Uh, another thing to, to note is that um, half of these uh, patients are actually children. Um, there is an estimated 7,000 rare diseases identified now, and that number is actually growing because we've become better at, at diagnosing them and identifying them. And only over 5% uh, over of them have a treatment on the market. And even if, even in those 5%, the treatments are often not ideal. Uh, so we're talking about a really big problem. Um, luckily, there are some new technologies coming out uh, that 
you know, offer new uh, treatment uh, therapeutic avenues, right? So like gene therapies, um, uh, immunotherapies, where you re-engineer your own immune system to go after, uh, after tumors. Um, high throughput compound screening, which I think is really interesting because it combines uh, different technologies together, like computer vision, for example, um, which could lead to uh, finding new compounds and uh, making that a lot cheaper, which could be really good for, for rare diseases. Uh, but there's still a lot of resources needed to, uh, to develop these treatments. So, for example, um, an organized patient community, organized and approachable uh, patient community is really important. The foundations, uh, doctors, researchers, and the patients. Um, understanding the course of the disease as well, especially in rare, uh, a lot of trials are actually happening without a control group. So knowing what the disease normally does to people is really important to compare the effects of a drug. Uh, and of course, uh, the basic science, um, having potential compounds that could work, um, animal models that are being developed. So all these ingredients you still need to build. And uh, the problem is in the current system uh, that a lot of ideas actually don't uh, make it through. So the, the preclinical, you can do all the preclinical work, but at some point you're gonna uh, need to develop it in humans, which is a very costly uh, thing to do. Um, and many ideas don't even reach that uh, threshold uh, before it can go to a commercial. So um, what we wanted to do is to think like, how can we develop some of those resources you would need like earlier on and um, kind of uh, build, them, uh, build them right away. So to make the diseases more appealing uh, to get the bigger investments. The need for for what we are doing. So our, our mission is to accelerate development of therapies in rare disease. And uh, the way we approach that is by actually trying to make, uh, make it possible for patients and foundations to kind of come into the, come into the game and play a bigger role. Uh, so you have the doctors and the researchers on one hand, pharma and biotech, and how can we kind of uh, leverage the community and the uh, interest the community has. Uh, so we're building a, a research platform that is driven by, by patients and, and foundations that support uh, therapy development. And we can do many different things. For, for example, the research uh, studies, we can develop natural history studies. Uh, we can uh, support clinical trial design uh, with, with the platform and the data we have. Uh, we can help make the recruitment easier in, in the rare disease. Uh, we also offer a product back for patients in return. Um, so we help the patients by giving them hints on improving the quality of their uh, own record, which can help them in care, but also helps improve the, the research data set. Uh, and make it easy to share the record with a new doctor, uh, for example, for remote consultations. Like most of the uh, rare disease patients are not connected to center of excellence. So like the telemedicine part can, uh, can really help them out. Um, yeah, so part of the product, we have a site where they can uh, see their entire like clinical timeline with all the data that we have abstracted. Uh, you can see the uh, radiology like right in the web. Um, and we uh, also develop a lot of tools, uh, for example, this one for data abstraction, so converting the pile of papers, which uh, is still kind of the case, <laughs> converting that in usable um, uh, research data. Um, so in order to like, build uh, that organization that has the genuine drive, um, you need to build trust and accountability in the, in the core of, of the business the platform. So um, pa well, the first thing is patients have to like, own their own data. They are controlling uh, their consent. So that makes our organization relying uh, on their buy-in. And I think that is a very healthy thing. Um, being fully transparent about the research projects that we are doing. So, Everything that we uh, do with organizations and collaborators, we, we share that uh, with the patients that uh, participate. And of course, we need a business model that aligns with the mission. Uh, the mission is uh, getting more companies to work in your rare disease. And um, that is really important because every, 
every day, everybody in the organization so should kind of do automatically the right thing. Um, yeah, so some of the benefits is if we launch in, uh, new diseases, uh, we can reduce the risk and save time uh, for new companies to enter. Uh, and an educated uh, patient community can lead to better uh, quality of the data. Uh, so we are constantly like, re-educating patients about the record, about the data models we are after. And uh, they, in turn, they go uh, to their doctors, for example, and, and ask for this. Uh, and because we work directly with patients and based on their consent, we can reuse this data many times over for lots of different research studies. Uh, so yeah, I want, the, I want an organization with a genuine drive to, uh, to develop, uh, to, to pave the way for drug development for rare, uh, rare diseases. Uh, so to kind of sum it up, um, literally hundreds of millions of people in the world suffer from rare disease, and I became, from one day to the next, I became one of them. So it was really, uh, this, this number is probably growing as well. Um, one of the things to, to also think about is um, that at some point, maybe all diseases will uh, become rare, right? Like, as we become better at identifying them and being more precise, like, uh, who knows that, that, that number where, th where that grows. But I think in, um, in rare diseases, we can really learn a lot of new things on how to, uh, how to approach it. Um, yeah, we, we absolutely, for rare, we need uh, to, to change the way we think about developing treatments. Like, we don't have the luxury, we cannot get away uh, without that creativity. Um, what is exciting, though, is the current acceleration of uh, the new technologies as well, like uh, biotech and information technology. So they create opportunities, especially for rare diseases. Uh, but one thing I, I know for sure, we really need to work together um, to convert these problems into real opportunities. So that's my uh, message to all of you, um, to kind of always think about the real problem and um, uh, try make an extra effort uh, to to collaborate. Uh, so if you work in rare disease or you want to talk or have, have some exponential ideas, you can contact me here. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Awesome. Um, I learned about you in this new journal Neo.life that Jane Metcalf founded. Yep. Also the one of the co-founders of Wired. Uh, I think the lesson here is that it, the future of health, medicine, pharma comes from different individuals. Have, have you met folks now that have changed their path based on what you've done? Um, yeah, like, of course, we are still early, but um, we are trying to kind of create tangible impact uh, today for patients as well. Like, you never really know, like with, with treatments, if, uh, if it's going to work, right? So... Um, if we can help them today, for example, with connecting them to a specialist remotely, uh, that already has impacted uh, people's lives and uh, the choices they made in the care. Great, inspirational work. Thank you, Anna. Thanks. Thank you.